I'd like to welcome everybody to uh, the Transforming Teaching and Learning uh, Committee meeting. And uh, this meeting was posted and is following the, um, is pursuant to Governor Abnett's temporary suspension of open meeting laws. And uh, we're looking forward to the uh, topics tonight. Uh, we do have um, the necessary people here, so we are able to move forward. And we're going to start the meeting today with um, Dr. Alicia Nayola talking about Pathway to Reopening 2020-2021. Thank you, Dr. Reiniger, uh, Dr. Provostos, <coughs> board members, uh, senior administration, and audience. So uh, earlier last week, we had shared that we wanted to spend some time today talking about our pathway to reopening as we look to the fall school year, the 2020-21 school year. Um, as you know, we put out a document uh, last week uh, outlining some of the processes that we were looking at as we reopen schools in the fall. Uh, particular, particularly in that pathway to reopening document, we sent, spent some time sharing with our families uh, two big two big topics, one being what would academic instruction look like in the fall, and then as well as talking about health and safety protocols that we were looking to institute as we start to bring students back into our school system. And so that pathway to reopening document was designed to give our communities an overview, maybe not full detail because Ultimately, as, as we identify data regarding the number of students that we will have uh, coming back into our school system, that will drive some of the decision making going forward. But it, in essence, it gave our, our community what were those highlights of, of health and safety protocols we would be instituting and what would instruction look like, not just in our mm -hmm. traditional face-to-face -face programming, but what would it look like for our students that would be uh, choosing to return to school remotely. And so in our document today, we're going to spend a little bit of time, uh, a little bit of time uh, recapping some of that, but more so focusing on what are the things that are going on moving forward between now and August 10th when we reopen schools. So as I mentioned, there were two key aspects of uh, our pathway to reopening and our processes. So we are looking, one, at academic instruction, as I mentioned, health and safety protocols. protocols. So we'll, we'll talk about those in a little bit. But I want to focus on academic instruction. And so in the document that we shared with our community, we asked our families to make a selection regarding what, what type of instruction they were looking towards in the fall with their children. Um, we know that, that we're at the beginning of July and we're still um, a month and a half, give or take, uh, away from August 10th. However, obviously any kind of changes to, to our processes is going to require a, a certain degree of planning. And so we asked our families to select what option they were interested in for their children. We took the opportunity within our uh, Pathway to Reopening document to give our families a little bit more explanation about what face-to-face -face instruction was going to look like what remote instruction within a synchronous and asynchronous uh, method would look like. And we also um, identified a hybrid model for our families to consider. And so we did note in our document that um, as of the date that we put that document out, that hybrid was not an option. Uh, we were petitioning the state to consider allowing us to offer a hybrid, a hybrid being a combination of face-to-face -face and remote. Uh, in the document, we did say we were interested in hybrid, uh, at least at our junior and senior level. And so that, that discussion is still going on at the state level. Uh, we're hoping to hear soon whether hybrid will be an option. But as always, we try and plan ahead. And so we've been having a lot of discussion regarding if the state allows us to offer a hybrid model, what would it look like in our school district? Could it possibly be alternating school days as an option? Uh, if hybrid came into play, at what point would we bring our hybrid students into the school system? Uh, obviously, there's a lot of planning. And in light of, of what we are experiencing just um, across our state and across our county with, with number of COVID cases, we want to make sure that as we 
uh, as we implement any of these processes that we are doing so responsibly and that we're taking into consideration the health and safety of our students and staff. So we're still working through a hybrid model and what that could look like. Um, so we're, we're looking at a number of options. And so we're, we're certainly hopeful that uh, the state uh, chooses to allow that. I think the more options that families have, uh, the better able we are to meet their needs. And so we'll continue to, to look at, at, um, at what those options look like. I will tell you that as of today, uh, we've had close to 8,000 responses from our families. Uh, when we look at that, what percentage breakdown looks like between face-to-face -face and remote, uh, right now we have about 63% of our families that have responded opting for a remote, uh, a remote option. And then about 37% that are interested in continuing to come back into the schools at, at a 37% rate. Um, we still have some time till tomorrow to, to receive some additional forms. Um, once we have those results, we'll go ahead and, and calibrate that information, share it out with our campuses. All of our school administrators are returning next week. So a big part of what their work will be will be to identify our other 10,000 plus students and identify helping uh, guide them and, and give them information in order so that they can make an informed decision with regard to what pathway they will choose. So all of that data is critical because knowing exactly what our numbers look like will really guide a big portion of our planning. And so as we work ourselves through um, this presentation, you'll, you'll realize just how critical those numbers are as we plan ahead for, for the fall semester. Um, so the second item, and so as you know, as we're working through this academic instruction, what I call a bucket, just a, a bucket of items within academic instruction that we need to make sure that we have in place so that we can have that successful opening that we're, we're all looking forward to. There's a number of things that we need to take into consideration. So aside from knowing what learning pathways children are going to be uh, returning to our school in, we also have to think about our academic calendar. And so uh, every indication is that depending on how these COVID numbers move forward, there could be some potential closures in the future. And so we want to be prepared for that. And so we have to, part of what we have to do is look at our academic calendar. And should there be a need for us to have any kind of closure, what, how would our calendar be impacted? And so what are some adjustments that we may have to make in order to be prepared for that? Um, the next item that you'll see there is, is dealing with state testing windows. And so the state has been very clear in indicating that the accountability system next year will not go away and that we will have testing happening. And so Dale Garcia through her department is working on identifying those testing windows. The state has made some adjustments to the testing windows saying that we will be able to test into June. And so uh, Dalia Garcia is working on that and identifying what's the best process uh, to give our students every opportunity to, to, to demonstrate where they are at uh, with regard to uh, state assessments. Uh, we are also looking at what is a standardized school supply list look like. Every year we have a school supplies list that our campuses put out, but obviously this is gonna be a unique year when we think about the fact that we will have some students returning face to face, but obviously as we look at our percentages, we'll also have students that are learning from home. So what become the appropriate school supply list for those students? And, and in some cases, the supplies may be a little bit different, uh, just designed to address whatever that learning environment is going to be. And so we are, we are working with our elementary and secondary school principals to identify and, and their staff to identify what those supply lists will be. Um, with as many students as we have that have replied that they are interested in and in going through a remote learning option, one of the things that we obviously learned when we went into, uh, into school closure was that we really needed to look at the connectivity issues that our students were going through. And so our technology department has been spending a lot of time focused in that arena. And so one of the, the areas that they are working through the connectivity plan that we have developed for next year is the idea behind a park and learn. 
And so we call it a park and learn because our schools will be equipped in order for our families if they need to have some type of internet access for them to be able to come and park in our uh, in our parking lots and be able to access uh, technology the the internet uh, via that route. And so we have we have our folks that are working on how do we increase that connectivity level at each of our campuses in order to give our families that opportunity. The other way that we are also looking at providing increased connectivity is an is the idea behind mobile units where we actually have units that will. Uh, go into those areas where we've already identified there, is, there are connectivity issues and be able to provide that kind of access. So um, almost like an internet on wheels where we could equip our buses with, um, with internet access and go into certain neighborhoods and families can still be able to access internet. Um, you know, we, we call them connectivity routes uh, as opposed to bus routes, but just these connectivity routes where we let our families know we're gonna be in these particular areas. So that should a student be working from home uh, remotely, then they're able to download whatever uh, whatever assignments and, and work that needs to be done uh, in order to be able to, to get them connected to instruction. Uh, the other item that we're also working within our connectivity plan uh, so uh, obviously the state has brought forward our, the concept of synchronous instruction and so in order for synchronous instruction to happen, our teachers at the campus need to be able to work remotely with students. And so we are, we are evaluating what our broadband capabilities are at each campus to ensure that our teachers are, uh, across the campus are able to do simultaneous instruction and not uh, weigh down the broadband capabilities at each campus. And so a uh, big shout out to our technology department. They really have done a lot of work in this arena. Uh, and so we feel like uh, even with the larger number of students shoot, opting for remote instruction right now, that, that we're in a position to be able to meet their needs. Another lesson learned as we were going through the, the spring implementation was that our teachers had to use their own personal cell phones and, and uh, telephone devices to communicate with students. And so, you know, we appreciate it all, all their, their own willingness to do that, but we also know that we need to support them in that arena. And so we are, we are identifying communication systems that will allow teachers to still maintain that type of contact uh, and connection with our students without necessarily using their own, uh, their own cell phones, their own, uh, landlines at home having to give out phone numbers and so forth and so um, our, our technology department is also looking at that and so we're at a point where where we're close to identifying what that system will be that our teachers will be able to use uh, in those types of settings one of the things that we started working on last spring as we went into remote teaching and learning was providing guidance to our staff on, on what does remote teaching and learning look like, the logistical aspects, not so much the instructional, we'll talk about that in a little bit, but more of the logistical, uh, how do you take attendance, how, uh, you know, all the things that are critical that are still, that still need to be accomplished with students, uh, even if they are learning remotely. And so we have, we will have staff handbooks ready to go uh, first day of school for our, our staff on how, how you work through all of the logistical pieces um, that are now expectations of the state. I think the state was a little bit more flexible in the spring. Uh, as we begin the fall semester, they are now uh, bringing back a lot of the original requirements that were in place. And so we, we need to be ready to, uh, to comply with, with those expectations. And so we're, we're working to ensure our teachers are prepared. Uh, probably the biggest work that we have done this summer has come in the instructional reset. Uh, so under uh, Veronica Cortan, Lori Romero, and, and Joseph Villarreal, they have really spent a lot of time in redesigning what does instruction look like. Not just instruction in a face-to-face -face format, but just instruction as a whole, uh, whether that be remote or face-to-face, -face, uh, identifying what does true rigorous uh, instruction look like even in a remote setting that still promotes communication, collaboration, creativity, and critical thinking. And so uh, ju just some really exciting work that is happening there. Uh, I, I think that the instruction that our students are going to be receiving as they work remotely it is going to be nothing 
nothing even close to what they experienced in the spring. So uh, uh, certainly a big shout out to all those people that have been instrumental in, uh, in recreating uh, the curriculum in HCISD. And then one of the items that we, we just have to be prepared for is that with the increase in cases uh, across the county, across the state, uh, no doubt we will experience situations where our employees will, will um, where we will have confirmed cases. And so what are our processes for returning people to work? And so what does that decision making look like? What are all those aspects that we take into consideration? And so our human services has been, uh, has been working through those processes to ensure uh, that we are making the best decisions for our districts, our, st our district, our staff, and, and our students. So uh, a lot of work that is going on uh, in our human services department in this arena. And so these are, are just a few items, but every department across our, our district is having some degree of impact within the work that is happening as we get ready for fall. Uh, obviously, this is the instructional side, but the other big side that we, that we continue to uh, want to reassure our parents around is what those health and safety protocols are going to be that we will implement for, for our <coughs> students as, and staff as they return uh, in the fall. And so one of the items that, that continues to be a recurring piece that we hear from CDC, we hear from all, uh, from all entities is the importance of sanitation and disinfection. Uh, one of the lessons that we learned this summer as we were doing our summer programming, and, and I'm so glad that we had the opportunity to bring our students in to, to truly implement these protocols and know what that would look like. Uh, it's one thing to write up a plan. It's another one to actually put it in place and work it through and, you know, iron out kinks and figure out all of those, those pitfalls that are potential. And so we, we had an opportunity to work through all of that. And so a lot of these health and safety protocols that you will see here were many that we used during the summer um, as we, as we um, sat with all of our coordinators that ran summer programming and kind of debriefed on you know, what worked, what didn't work. Uh, everything that, that you see on here, the, the general feedback from all of them was that these were all health and safety protocols that we could continue to implement in the fall, that they were doable even with increased numbers. And so, um, so that, that was a, a big learning experience from that process. So in the disinfection, we had our custodial staff uh, on a schedule rotate, on a schedule of disinfection in our hallways, whether that was our restrooms, our, our door handles, all of the things that were high touch areas. Um, and we, they were on a schedule. So we knew and custodians knew when these things had to happen as opposed to leaving those to chance. Um, and so that was, that was a, a pretty reassuring piece to our staff that was working, that they actually were seeing people um, doing these, these pieces. Um, and in addition, uh, we also got, uh, I think I had shared with you all earlier on when we were planning uh, what summer and fall was gonna look like, that we were going to purchase some uh, disinfecting sprayers, some sanitizing sprayers that uh, that you could use in a classroom and, and they were um, electrostatic, which means that when the droplets land on whatever surface, they stay there, they, they, um, they, they don't <coughs> float into the air, they actually uh, uh, adhere to surfaces. And so we actually, it looks, it looks kind of, it's an <laughs> oh, interesting little in. gadget, but, um, but we got those in and so we will have those available at all, all of our campuses it's certainly going to speed up the process for our custodial staff to be able to disinfect bigger areas in a faster amount of time. And so that, that'll always be a great thing because that'll ensure that as we start every morning, every classroom in our, in our schools uh, has been disinfected and sanitized uh, for our students. The other item and, and uh, on air quality upgrades, and I gotta, I gotta send a shout out to Ken Lee. Uh, when we first started having the discussions about health and safety protocols prior to COVID uh, really arriving in the Valley, um, one of the things that we talked about was air quality and the importance of air quality in all of our classrooms. One of the things that they already do is they use the highest grade of filters across our district, across every, every classroom, every campus. 
Um, and those are changed every month. But one of the things we talked about was how do we enhance that? And so one of the things that, uh, that Ken went out and found was an actual disinfectant that sprayed on the coils of the air conditioning system. So while the, the filters will filter out pollutants, what, what, it, what this will do is you spray this disinfectant on the coils, and so it keeps those coils disinfected so that the air that is constantly being circulated is, is in fact uh, purified to, some, to, to a greater degree. And so they have continued to use that. Um, they, are, they, have, they do that on a regular cycle to our air conditioning systems. And so uh, we're hopeful that between the combination of just using the highest quality filters and this disinfecting solution in our air conditioning system, that we will provide a, a certainly a much cleaner uh, and purified air for our students. Uh, the other item that we implemented this summer and we will move forward in the fall is doing screening and temperature checks for our students and staff. Uh, we did those in the summer and we weren't quite sure what that would look like. Could we accommodate numbers and, and things of that nature? Um, so one of the key pieces for us was when we used these processes with our strength and conditioning students. We had over 200 students that were coming to that program. And so our coaches were very easily able to do the screenings and temperature checks for our students. So we feel confident that that will be something that we will be able to do in the fall uh, at our campuses. So our principals will start working through that process of how do we, um, how do we prepare for that. The other piece that's sometime a, sometimes a concern because one of the, the big focuses was to limit any type of congregation. And so when students are arriving or leaving at school, those are the, some of the biggest times <coughs> where, um, where we potentially could see uh, degrees of congregation. So we've been, we've been going through these planning processes of what will drop off and dismissal look like. So as we talk about drop offs, we're actually fo we're, we're having discussions on whether we stagger drop offs and or we also identify multiple entry point, points. So the students are not just coming in through one door, but they can enter through multiple entry points and thus you minimize the degree of congregation that can happen uh, when you work off of singular entrances. And so we feel that that will be, uh, uh, that will uh, assist us in minimizing that congregation. And in the morning, one of the great pieces is that parents don't drop off all their, their children all at, the, at 8 o'clock or 8.45, 8 whatever time we're starting school. They tend to drop off over an extended period of time. So it's rare that we have huge numbers arriving at the same time. So we, we think that uh, the early drop offs will, will not be an issue with congregation. We are having discussions with the principals about dismissal because campuses dismiss all at the same time. And so we are looking at, at uh, staggered dismissals that will allow students to dismiss a group at a time so that we don't have large numbers congregating after, after school. Um, hand sanitizers, we were fortunate that very early on we were thinking already about uh, sanitizers and hand washing and so forth. So we uh, very early on put in our orders for hand sanitizer and so, uh, and in fact, we just, we are scheduled to receive uh, an order from the state as well. They, they are also assisting districts in, in providing additional um, hand sanitizer. So we are very comfortable that we have more than enough hand sanitizer to put in every classroom and in our hallways on hand sanitizing stations um, so that students don't have to go out and buy that. There used to be a time when we used to ask kids to bring those. Uh, that is not something that our students will need to do. We're very confident that we have uh, the, the appropriate supplies. More importantly, CDC talks about the importance of hand washing, and that's really one of our big focuses when we think about how do we uh, protect the health and safety of our students. And so uh, one of the big emphasis this coming year will be on the importance of hand washing. And so at the very beginning of the year, that's, that's going to be um, the first day of school training and, and really working through how do we create those supervised hand, uh, hand washings. But most of our hand washings tend to happen in our restrooms. That's where we have our sinks. And so we knew that that could not be the sole place where we had opportunities for students to hand wash. And so uh, we have actually purchased 
hand washing stations and I'll share what those look like for you. But those are freestanding uh, hand washing stations are portable. You can put them just about anywhere as uh, whether that's when kids are, co are coming in from PE or after lunch, we can put those just about anywhere where it doesn't make us dependent on restrooms as, as the location for students to hand wash. The other thing that, that we thought of very early on was the uh, water fountains. So some water fountains, depending on water pressure, students may have to get very close to that spigot. And so ultimately we felt that that was not something that we wanted to chance uh, for our students or our staff. And so what we're actually going to do in the fall is um, we've been working with our child nutrition department. And so they are actually going to provide water bottles to every student in the district. And so we will also have water bottle refill stations throughout the campus, allowing students to be able to fill their water bottles and not have to use those, those traditional water fountains. Um, the other big piece that that's important to us as we look and we continue to hear from CDC and uh, I, I think one of the, the biggest ones is the social distance and that that's just has become one of the, the most critical uh, protocols just nationwide as we look at how do we address COVID-19 and so our the one thing that we are not going to negotiate is social distancing across our, our campuses. And so whether that's social distancing in our classrooms and how we sit students, whether that's social distancing in our lunchrooms, whether that's in our PE, whether that's in our hallway, that will be a consistent protocol. Um, now, a, a lot of, a lot of our, our programs are gonna be dependent on what our numbers look like. Our staffing will, will be guided by that, but our goal is to ensure that our students are, are social distancing uh, wherever they may be. The other item uh, that we had already made a decision on, uh, I, certainly the, the governor put out his uh, executive order requiring masks at, at all locations, and that executive order will also apply to schools. But we had already made a decision that this was going to be that other critical factor as we consider the health and safety of our students and staff. And so absent of the, the governor's executive order, we will continue to require masks for all students and staff. Um, one, of the, one of the questions that we sometimes get is, um, what about the little ones? Uh, you know, our pre-K, one, two, the, the babies, and, and will they be able to handle masks? And so we've made some adjustments to that. So we, we are actually going to look at a combination of masks and face shields. Uh, we were fortunate that we did receive some from the state and we have purchased some, uh, some for our little ones. Uh, in fact, I just had, they just brought me one, and so I don't know if y'all can see, but this is a, a little child's uh, face shield. And so the, these are the ones that we are looking at for our, for our babies. Uh, you know, we've been, we've been working with what's the best tool or, or personal protective equipment for our students. And we think for our, for our little ones, this is a more appropriate uh, item than necessarily masks. And so it's, it's trying to make sure that we're making decisions that are age appropriate. Same thing, you know, that we, we sometimes get questions about, well, are they gonna be required to wear them all day? Uh, can a third grader really work with a mask all day long? And so no, we're, we're cognizant of that. And so our staff will build in those mask breaks. And so what does a mask break look like? It, it means that we go outside and we give kids an opportunity to, to not have to wear those masks and obviously lunch and and certain areas, those, those are going to be um, situations. But whether they have their masks on or not, the other factor that's always going to, uh, going to underscore everything is that social distancing. So whether they have their masks on or off, the social distancing is, not, is, is going to be in place for students. And so that, that I think we're, we're confident that between those two pieces, those are going to be some of our more critical ones. Um, the other one that we have instituted, um, especially at the elementary level. So at the elementary level prior to this year, we did have some departmentalization where students at the elementary level, especially at the upper grades, would switch classes 
Uh, part of that was uh, in preparation for what was coming with secondary. But as we go into this school year, one of the decisions that we have made is that our element that, that we are looking at with health and safety protocols, but there's just uh, so many others. You know, we've had conversations about our transportation uh, because we do have some students that are gonna be coming face to face who will not have the need to ride the bus. And so we have established our, we're working on establishing the protocols for buses. And so we're looking at things like assigned seating and then families sitting together uh, as opposed to necessarily separating every single student, but keeping the family groupings together uh, as much as possible. So that again, we're, we're um, instituting health and safety protocols that make sense but that still also um, are, are a high enough standard that we're protecting the health and safety of our students. Um, I will tell you, we've gotten a lot of guidance from the state throughout this process. Uh, a lot of the health and safety protocols that you see here uh, were ones that, uh, that were recommended, but not necessarily required. And so we, we made the decision that we were going, the health and safety uh, of our students was just gonna be held at a higher standard. And so while some of these are not required by the state, many of these I, I would say are not required by the state, we just felt that they were important and critical for our students. Um, so I wanna give you a little bit, these last few slides that I'm gonna share are just kind of like a show and uh, <clears throat> show and tell. So these are the masks that we have ordered for our students and our staff. And so these are our cloth masks. We wanted to certainly highlight our, our school district. And so um, every student and staff member will receive uh, two masks. And, and ultimately we have more certainly that we'll distribute those. But we wanted them to, to have uh, something that, that we are providing. We know that that's not always a possibility uh, considering the, the economic times that we are in. And so we wanted to make sure that we were providing uh, providing masks to everybody that, that works in our school district and attends our schools. Um, one of the things that we're also looking at is the uh, how do we help our little ones understand what social distancing and six feet apart looks like. Uh, our older ones understand six feet better, but our little ones uh, may not always understand what six feet looks like. And so we are ordering floor decals for all of our elementaries and, and for some of our secondaries whenever they're needing to, to, to create that six foot distancing piece. But through, through these decals that we were, will have at our elementaries, we're hoping that our little ones will learn just that concept of six feet and, and uh, maintaining that social distancing. Uh, on your right hand side, you see some of the window decals that we will be putting out across our school district, uh, basically identifying that we are requiring face coverings um, throughout all of our facilities. Uh, the item that you see before you here is an easel that will be located at the front of all of our buildings. This one happens to say mask recommended because during the summer, uh, there were some facilities that we had where it was, it was at that point it was a recommendation Obviously, as we move into the fall, we've established that, that those will be required. And so these are just some <coughs> reminders and guidance to, to people that, that are accessing our facilities. What you have in front of me, I think Shane, uh, we've had a story that was done in the paper on these. These are the water stations. So right now, this one happens to be next to a water fountain because of the water source. But you'll see there's a foot pedal at the bottom so that students aren't having to touch or turn on anything. The student steps foot on that, and, and so obviously they're able to, to wash their hands through that. And then the soap, the soap uh, will be provided alongside that. Here are the water bottle stations, and so these are, are uh, being put across our, our school district, and so these will allow, whether it's the water bottle, and this one you happen to see a, a cup there for our staff members, but so uh, these water stations will be placed strategically across our campuses in order to uh, give our students that opportunity to refill their water bottles. Um, and so that, that concludes the, the, the bigger portion of the presentation. Um, I'm gonna move it to discussions and questions, but I did wanna take an opportunity to highlight for you all our frequently asked questions page. When we um, created our pathway to reopening document, 
we, you know, we spent a lot of time working through our head. What are some possible questions that families may have? And so we, we instant, we put all of those, uh, those possible questions through the verbiage in our, in our document. Um, however, we were still getting some of the, the questions that, that uh, we anticipated, but you know, may have been missed by, by our community. And so at that point, we wanted to make sure that we gave people the opportunity to work through the document. In the document, we did ask them to email us with any questions that they may have, because our, our, in, our goal was that once we started receiving those questions, we would stand up a frequently asked document. Uh, we didn't want to tell them, here's a frequently asked document um, without questions that, they, that were really suitable to where, what they wanted to know. And so um, we finally had enough questions to compile. And so we identified a frequently asked page. So it's www.hcisd.org, PTR, Pathway to Reopening, underscore FAQ. And so what you have on this page, um, wait. You'll have to close up the PowerPoint and open it up again. Yeah, I'm trying to, but the little thing keeps popping up at the top. You have to stop sharing and then open up the, the window. Let me see, there we go. Um, so you'll see here, uh, we had questions regarding academic instruction. And so there's a number of questions here. These were uh, some of the, the most popular ones that we right tended here. to see. Yeah. One of the other things that we did is we asked all of our PTA presidents, we, we brought together our city council PTA and we asked them to formulate for us as well, what are some potential questions that families may have? And so what you'll find in that document, and I'm not sure what happened, uh, you you'll find in that document uh, those questions as well. And so you'll see a number of them there, um, some talking about uh, what about participating in a hybrid program. So, so no different than what I shared with you, that, that is in the works. We had some questions about special needs students. Uh, some were very specific. So we still have some, some questions that, that we responded to individually uh, because they were very specific. These were more of the general types of questions. Um, for some of those specific questions, either we were able to give them an immediate answer or we referred them to work with their, their campus uh, to identify how best to address that, that particular question. And then the other types of questions fell within the health and safety uh, arena where we get, we're getting questions about what does class size look like? Um, what are we doing to ensure the health and safety of students, visitors, uh, what would lunch and PE settings look like, things of that nature. And so we'll continue to update this page uh, for our families regardless as we move forward. Um, and so uh, that, We'll conclude my, my portion of the of the presentation. I'll, I'll certainly welcome any uh, questions that the committee may have. Thank Madam, you, Dr. Nyola. Madam Chair, I have a couple yes. of questions. Please. Yes, I, th I think all of us probably have a few questions. Um, sure. I've got quite a few, so I'll, I'll limit mine and then I'll yield it to my colleagues and everyone else. And if I don't hear some of the responses from my questions, then I, I guess I'll go back and sure. continue it. Um, first of all, the presentation was fantastic. Great job, Alicia, uh, on, on, on um, uh, going through the details on each and every single one of what you're talking about. I don't have any questions at all on the health and safety protocols. I think you hit a home run. I think we're doing everything worldly possible to make sure that when the kids come to class, they're going to be safe. If the teachers come to class, they're going to be safe. I do have some questions on one, state testing. On the state testing, so I'm assuming that we're still going to be offering all the core courses. Is that correct? Or that are we is correct. going to be doing some English and math? Or we do, it's business as usual. That is correct. All of our academic core courses will continue to be offered. Uh, one of the things that we are evaluating is more along the lines of elective courses, uh, because not every course lends itself to remote instruction, in particular, as we think about courses like CTE, and some of those just do not lend themselves. But the core courses are non-negotiable. Those will be, every student will have to take those. Okay, great. I guess my next question is, you know, kind of at the beginning of the presentation, you had um, remote, you had hybrid, and you had face-to-face. -face. As we're moving forward, to the, forward on this, 
um, some of the percentage that you said was 30% so far was face-to-face. -face. Over 60% is some form of hybrid or remote. That's kind of a little scary because uh, that, that's just going to make our job a little harder because that 30 can turn down to, to 17 to 16, depending if the virus gets a little worse. But I guess my question is, as we're doing that, are we looking at what teachers can offer what courses? Because there are some teachers that are a little, that, that, and, and for lack of better words, and trying to be as careful with my words, but um, there are some teachers that have, have more years that, than others. You know, are, are, is there going to be some preferences on some teachers not having to do the face-to-face -face because of their age, because they have a history of illness, because maybe they have the chronic issues that are going on? Are, are we as a district looking at that when we start telling teachers and we start assigning um, responsibilities in classrooms? How are we handling all that and how are we working on that? Sure. So, um, so one of the things that we spent a lot of time on this summer was one in the training and, and making sure that our teachers were prepared to deliver remote instruction. But coming back to, to your question, so every teacher should be in a position to be able to deliver remote instruction. Some may be further along than others. And so sometimes, so we're, we're gonna have to be also strategic in how we identify which teachers will teach remote and which ones will teach face-to-face uh, -face because we, we have to continue to ensure the, the strong instruction for our students regardless of where they are, where they are sitting. Uh, but we, we anticipate that we will have staff that will have reservations uh, about returning to school and whether they will be sitting uh, in, in front of students in a classroom. Uh, within a hybrid, uh, we will have between remote, I'm sorry, between face-to-face -face and hybrid, that's going to be a combined number. Um, as far as where teachers will wind up, one of the things that we're getting ready to do, Mr. De Leon, is survey our staff and uh, and kind of find out and identify who are those staff that that do have reservations with regard to returning to work because they may have some underlying condition, whatever the situation may be. Now every case is unique. And so once we have the staff that has identified whatever their concern may be, we're, we're gonna have them work directly with our human services because uh, you know, we can't blanket uh, for, for people. And so uh, human services, we, we went through some of that when we brought our staff back. I'm talking about teachers, but I'm talking about our central office staff, our maintenance staff, when we returned people to work in the summer. And so human services worked with each person individually who had some type of situation, uh, worked with them on options. Sometimes there were some accommodations that could be made. Sometimes it, it just wasn't possible for whatever the reason may be. But, but our goal is that we, do, uh, we, we don't just expect to have our staff back and, and not take those things into consideration. Uh, but we are going to request that information from them and then have them work directly with human services um, on, on what the, the particulars around that situation may be. And then wherever we are able to accommodate and not compromise uh, the instruction of our students, then certainly we're gonna do everything we can to support them. So, uh, Madam <coughs> Chair, I have one last question then I'll yield to the, to the rest of the board. Please. Uh, uh, what happens if if, uh, and I don't know, if, uh, I guess this is to you, Alicia, or to, to uh, well, I'll, I'll address it to you. What happens if, if a child gives the COVID virus to the teacher and the teacher has to be quarantined for 14 days or maybe longer? Mm -hmm. Does that individual at that point in time use, do we, do they, can they claim workman's comp or do they take their sick or is that a special circumstance? How's that going to work? So, uh, and I, Debbie is with us, and so I, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll give you a brief, uh, a brief information on that, and then I'll turn it over to her. That, that certainly is, is her, um, her arena. But we do have the federal leave that's been, that's been made available to our staff. Um, and so, Deb, anytime we have that kind of situation where we have a staff member that, um, that identifies as having been confirmed or is displaying symptoms, whatever that may be, they are referred to Debbie and then she guides them through the process. 
we have thought about that fact uh, as we look at the fall because now I have a teacher that's gone. They may be ill enough that they can't deliver instruction. And so one of the things that uh, Veronica Corton is working on uh, alongside Deb is the ident identification of substitute staff that can be that is being trained alongside our teachers so that if we have to have um, if we have to bring an individual in to to uh, teach in that class that teacher that substitute teacher has gone through the training that the rest of our staff has gone through on the instructional reset but I I'll turn it over to Deb Deb I don't know if there's something additional that you want to speak to on that uh, on what would happen in that type of situation Thank you, Dr. Mayola, and good afternoon, everyone. And so exactly as Dr. Mayola mentioned, we have been working with our employees as they have been returning um, to the school district and should they be faced with a COVID-related situation um, because of the Federal uh, Emergency Paid Sick Leave Act that went into effect April the 1st and expires December the 31st, we have been able to work with our employees and offering them this type of paid sick leave if it's a COVID-related situation that they are faced with. And so all employees are eligible for the 10 days. Um, after that, should they still be faced with the situation, then there are options for the employees uh, where they, if they have their own leave available, they have state personal leave or sick days available, um, then they may certainly take those days as well. Um, if they've exhausted all of their leave, then part of that federal uh, emergency leave will qualify them for partial payment. And so we have been working with our employees um, and of course we're going to exhaust all options um, before we ever get to a dock. Uh, there is you know, definitely options available. Um, to date, we've not had our employees that are having to face uh, docks and pay because we have these um, I, you know, leave options available and our employees are, are able to take the leave that they're needing so that they can care for themselves or their loved ones that are faced with a COVID-related situation. So we continue to work with our employees and offer them the options that are best for them and their families. Yeah, Deb, and, and thank you for that information. And something just, just to consider and, and maybe for the board to, to consider as well with, with the superintendent and, and the, the administrative team is, you know, I'd hate for any, any teacher that, I mean, talk about, you know, essential employees. You know, we, you talk about the firefighters, you talk about police, police uh, 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 officers. You know, right now in this COVID, as the school districts are, are opening up, our teachers are our first responders. And so what I would hate is they're putting themselves, you know, their their love for, for, for the child and their love for, for their, their profession, their position is is going back to work. What I would hate is if they, if someone, God forbid, one or two of them get ill, and that is a great possibility, unfortunately. I'd hate for them to just have the 10 days and then they're gonna if they don't have any sick, they're going to dock and they're going to lose their they're going to lose some of their their salary. So it's something that maybe later on we could discuss and we can go into details on on maybe some strategies so a teacher doesn't you know it doesn't have to to be docked for a week or a week and a half if they if they're sick more than the ten days, um, especially when when you see teachers that are are, are there's you know they're single parents and they're just they're the head of their own household, but. Again, uh, thank you for that information. I appreciate it. And uh, Dr. Reiniger, thank you very much for being patient. I'll go ahead and yield it to the rest of the board. Thank you. Thank you for your questions, sir. Um, other trustees have questions, please. Uh, yeah, Dr. Reiniger? Yes, sir. So question I had uh, is, so if, if there's folks participating um, from other districts, students from, from that are that were previously at other um, districts, have another home district. I understand that uh, we won't get any funding if they're participating in any online remote instruction. Is that correct? And then, so does that mean that um, they have to actually change, right? Districts, they have to actually consider themselves uh, now as at Harlingen as their home district. And right. if they want to attend uh, any remote learning opportunity with ACISD, uh, before we get any sort of um, uh, funding for that student, is that correct? Correct, Dr. Perez. They they can't be enrolled in two districts at once, and so the the only way that we receive funding is when the student is actually enrolled in our district, and so they they would have to go through that process because then we would submit them as students of our district to the state, and then the compensation starts to happen that way. All right. Well, I mean, I, this is obviously very. Um, 
very much a, a fluid situation, and I, I applaud uh, y'all for the great work you're doing. It's not easy right now, um, and everybody wants to be out there first and communicate their plan first and that kind of stuff, which is a necess not necessarily the smartest thing to do with everything being in, uh, you know, in flux. Uh, there, there's a lot of movement, and there's a lot of, uh, it's life is dynamic, and this virus is, you know, uh, obviously um, has a course of its own and the numbers are going up and this, that, the other. We don't know when they're going to come down. And so um, I, I think we just have to make sure we keep communicating with the, commu uh, with the community. What, what, what are the different options? What are they going to look like? But just explain to them that, that, you know, this is not something that we can decide right now. The school, beginning of the school year, if it still, if it doesn't change, it may change. But the beginning of the school year right now, um, it's just too far away for us to say, this is exactly what we're gonna do. And I mean, I think that a lot of people just need to know that just to be patient and that kind of stuff. Um, you know, it doesn't help that, um, you know, let's be honest. I mean, nobody's come out and said nationally, as far as I'm concerned, uh, as far as I'm aware, nationally or from the state that, you know, public schools are essential that we're gonna, you know, and maybe they have, or maybe I just haven't heard it, but I think, Sometimes people need to realize that that education is essential. We have to figure out a way to do this, you know, and it's essential for a variety of reasons. Number one, the education of our students um, must go on, but also, you know, it provides an opportunity for a lot of people to to work and stuff like that because you know they have to have their kids, you know, in schools. And so it's a very complex situation. The 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 points that Javier made were uh, were very uh, uh, important. Uh, you know, uh, we, we don't want to, you know, we don't want to get our staff sick, right? So we, we have to, all the precautions you outlined, you know, in your beautiful presentation, uh, obviously, if we do those things right, if we screen appropriately, if we have the right hygiene, if we have the right sanitation, if we have all the face masks and all the hand washing, if we do the right things, distancing, then we should be okay. But we don't necessarily want to go out of our way to, you know, to get our, especially our most vulnerable of our staff and teachers uh, sick. But by the same token, um, if we are saying, okay, the young ones are fine, let them be face to face, and the some of the, you know, teachers that, you know, are whatever beyond a certain age or so, so many years in the district, they can, they're okay to be. I mean, that won't work either, uh, because sometimes, you know, your best people for your remote learning, you know, you have to kind of. You have to kind of like uh, give preference to sort of the quality of the education. I think that should that should uh, be the deciding factor. We want the best education possible for our students, and so those folks that are most talented with the remote instruction should be do, allowed to do that, and should be actually promoted to do to do that, and and, and then help teach others uh, best practices of how to uh, improve upon you know their their uh, remote instruction uh, because this is the way of the future. It's not changing and. And I think that we need to embrace that. So we've got to be real careful and not just, I mean, we've got to be very um, nimble, very flexible. Um, and um, I just applaud you all for all the thoughtfulness of the plans that you're coming up with. And, and uh, we still don't know whether hybrid will be, a, you know, even funded model from the state. Um, I hope it will be, but we still don't know that yet, as you as you outlined. And so, but we, op, we have, you know, but there are other districts out there that are coming out and saying, this is what we're going to do. I mean, I guess they're just not going to get paid for it. That's fine, but we just don't know. And I think we just have to find out more from the state and then kind of, you know, and kind of go with that. But but the more we can more frequently communicate uh, with, with, with whatever we can communicate, even though it's uncertainty or options and this is what it could look like, but we don't know. Um, I guess folks are wanting to kind of um, find out even, the, even, even though it's really far out, they kind of want to know what's going on. And so... And I know y'all are doing that, but but just uh, I wanted to applaud y'all for the incredible incredible amount of work that goes into this because this is not easy. And I know y'all are doing the best job you can. Y'all don't get enough praise for the work you do. So I uh, just wanted to thank you. And, and um, that's all I have. Thanks. Thank you, Dr. Pettis. I know that um, Mr. Strubhart is going to give us an update on the communication plan for the reopening part of part of a, a theme that that we that we hear. But I do want to make sure there aren't any other questions on on this first yeah. presentation. And I I do recognize we're getting close to six o'clock as well. So, Do Dr. Moniker, I, I had a Please, question. Dr. Mooney. Okay. Yeah. Just great presentation, Dr. Nola. Uh, very thorough, as usual. Wouldn't expect anything less from you. Um, 
My question, I got a couple of questions, but um, regarding the polling, is that, can that be duplicated? So is somebody screening that information? And, and what percentage of our families have replied? Okay, um, so, so we, uh, so you're, you're talking about the response rate? Yes. What, what, what is the percentage of response rate? Uh, so 8,000 out of 18,000. Well, that's 8,000 families out of 18,000 kids. So well, correct. 8,000 well, 8,000 um, students that have that have been accounted for out of the 18,000. And so our, our goal is that once we return to school next week, that's part of what the work will be uh, of our campuses is identifying what's the where are the other 10,000 students and what what is their plan going to be. Right. So is it, I mean, even if that's the 10,000, we, we're, we're saying we got 30%, we're planning for 30%, but 10,000, 10, that's a huge well, number. And, and so as we planned, we also, when we, when we went through this process, we said that, that, that whoever didn't respond, in essence, we need to think of them as face-to-face -face students, right? Because we need to plan for what those bodies will look like. However, uh, we're also going to work through this process of um, of, ident of making the phone calls and making the outreach to try and get as close to a, a final number as possible. And so that that will be um, much of the work of what will happen next week uh, with our with our remaining uh, students. So theoretically speaking, if ten thousand people show up, can we accommodate that with six feet just social distancing? So one of the things that we did prior to um, prior to us even getting at this point, we actually did evaluations of all of our campuses and classrooms, and we did an evaluation based on could we account accommodate 50% of the students, could we accommodate 60% of the students, could we accommodate 70% of the students, and so we have that information to guide us for the most part. 70% uh, is doable. It starts to, you know, we start to have multiple issues once we start moving into that 80% or so, but anything in that 50, 60, 50 and 60 is for sure 70. We start having to make some, some necessary adjustments, but it's doable. It's once we get into that 80 and 90 that, uh, that we wind up possibly having issues there. Um, but I think that, that the process is doable. Uh, even more so if the state is able to accommodate a hybrid option. You know, Alisa, to, to uh, tap on to, to Bobby's question, um, out of the 30%, and let's just assume that, that we do get the response from the additional 10,000, it still may end up still being 30%. Um, sure. So if it's that 30%, regardless when we, we get the results from everyone, is that 30%, 75% of that 30% elementary, or is it a, who, who, out of that 30%, what's the, is it more of the elementary kids Shane, that, that? that the parents are responding on, that? or is it the, the middle school or the high school? I have that. It, no, I, I don't have that specific answer, but I will tell you that we were getting response from all across the district, all campuses. So it wasn't, you know, we had, at the outset, we had thought maybe we're going to get more response from this grade level than, than this other. Now, we are seeing that a little bit more of the face-to-face -face is coming from the high school uh, portion. And I think that's, we kind of anticipated that, that we would have more of a face-to-face -face response rate at the high schools because students yeah, participate in activities and, um, they, you know, there's other social implications there that sometimes guide kids. Here we go. I think we have this was um, a couple of days ago. Shane popping that up. This was a couple of days but ago. You'll see that that um, if you look on your left hand side where you have the face to face, uh, you'll see that our that our highest percentage rate was at the ninth, tenth, eleventh, and twelfth grades. Uh, you have forty three percent of the seniors, uh, forty six percent of freshmen. Uh, so your your highest numbers of are face to face are coming at the at the at the high school level. But the percentages, for the most part, uh, under high school are staying in the mid to high 30s. Okay. Thank you, Shane. Thank you. Mm -hmm.
Good questions. Okay, thank yeah, you. I think I would add, well, for some reason I keep, I, I got pushed out of the, of the conference. I'm glad I got back in. Um, also, regarding communication, which, which Dr. Pettis was saying, can't, yeah, I totally agree with that. We just got to make sure, even if we don't have information, I think we, we and I think we, we, we've done that. Kudos to Shane and his department for communicating, communicating, communicating. Even though people sometimes can't find the information, I know you're doing it, Shane, and, and your team is doing a great job of, of putting out that information. Thank you. Uh, even if it's, if we just got to repeat it, you know, and I, with my experience, you got to email it, you got to text it, you got to call them. It's like so many different avenues that you got to cover before they, oh, I didn't realize it was, you, that was going on. Um, and then, of course, what, regarding uh, the teachers, great questions that you had uh, earlier and uh, you answered them. So I'm, I'm glad we're, we're taking that into consideration. That's super important. Javier, thank you for those questions. Uh, I agree. We need to know, you know, if, if there's people out there that don't feel safe coming back, uh, we need to take that into consideration. So thank you. Great presentation. D Dr. Roger. Thank you. Dr. Roger, it's yes. Greg. Uh, I have one question and that is uh, for Dr. Noyola. Uh, Alicia, so the, those who choose the virtual and at home, w what about those who their grades fall and they're, they're failing? How, what are you going to do to re remedy that? Sure. And, and so those are more of the individual conversations that teachers are going to have to have with, with families. Um, you know, there may come a point where we need to have those conversations about whether they are best suited it within a face to face. And I, I think one of the things that's going to happen, I, I think that we have a lot of families that we're, we'll kind of be watching how it rolls out for face to face students. And I, I would anticipate that that what they see will kind of drive their decision when we get to the first quarter. Uh, and I would venture to say exactly like, like Dr. Pettis said, that if we're doing a, and implementing all our protocols appropriately, that we're going, to, we're, we're going to see those health and safety protocols paying off. And I would anticipate that we would see more parents interested in coming back after the quarter. Uh, one of the things that we are, we are looking at also is how do we continue to provide uh, support for students who are struggling. Part of that is within that instructional reset, but also how do we continue to provide tutorial services and assistance um, for, for our students that are, that are working remotely. And so I think both of those pieces will come together so that we're able to continue to meet, uh, meet those needs of those kids because um, I, I would be surprised if we didn't have some students that, that are struggling um, you know, the decision is made for the health and safety, but instructionally they may, they may have some, some issues. And so, uh, so we're still looking to provide those, those tutorials and supports and resources for kids. Um, and, you know, in, in some cases, uh, as teachers are visiting with parents, we, we may wind up seeing that some of them may choose to come back into a face-to-face -face option. What about on, on testing? Is that going to be on an honor system? Um, so what we have talked about, especially as we talk about our pre-AP and AP courses, one of the things that we worked through when we were doing um, AP testing, when we were doing um, TSI testing and programs of that sort, is we actually implemented systems for, uh, for remote testing and what that needed to look like. The state has said you could not force students to come in for testing. But we, we have established protocols that we learned this summer as we were doing all of these other types of testings on how you can still continue to test kids remotely um, where they're sitting live in, in front of the teacher uh, and they are, you know, they, they actually have the, the computer set up in such a way that you're able to see the work that they're doing and, and things of that nature. So I, I think that they're, uh, based on some of the, the work that we did this summer, we think that we can still uh, maintain credibility in the testing that we, are, that we are going to be implementing as we move into the fall for those remote kids. Thank you very much. Uh, y'all are doing an incredible job. I don't envy you, and I'm so glad we have all of y'all doing this. You're doing a terrific job. Thank you. Thank you for those questions. Ms. Florier, I would anticipate you might have a question or two. I can, you got to unmute, though. 
Ms. Fleurier, we got to, can you unmute your, there you I go. Didn't. Really? Yep, now we can hear you. I, say I wasn't muted, I think the host didn't mute. But, but anyway, uh, thank you very much. And we don't have to answer these now because I know that, that uh, we're in a time crunch, but but I would like to have them at some point discussed, you know, in front of the entire board. So it, it's fine, we can do it now or later. And probably would have a lot more as well. First of all, I want to join my colleagues in thanking staff for doing an extraordinary job. Wow, 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 super wow, super wow. Thank goodness we have your leadership and, it, and that will be what, what will uh, help determine the course of uh, the history we're about to make here. Um, however, a couple of questions, um, and, and uh, you know, not to be pessimistic, but to be realistic. Much of what I am reading is talking in terms, Alicia, of if there is one case, the school shuts down for a while and, and remote kicks in immediately. So I don't know if that's something that we've thought about, that we've talked to our health experts like Dr. Reininger about, uh, Dr. Castillo. I, I don't know what direction the state is going in that. But I have, that's certainly the reading that I've been seeing. So I guess what I'm asking is, what is our anticipated protocol if and when that first one case happens, either to an adult or a child? Uh, because as we all know, we're even more contagious when we're pre-symptomatic. So the taking the temperature and all the modifications that we are doing are extraordinary and necessary, but they, they won't catch, they, they won't catch everybody. And so I think everybody recognizes that, but I'm interested in that. What, what's going to be our, our protocol if and when this happens and, and how, will we, how will we move to do that? The second thing I'm, I'm wondering about at some point, please, are, you know, is, is a more in-depth discussion on the special programming, be it dyslexia, health, be it GT courses, um, you know, what, what, how we're going to handle all of those. Um, and also the um, the arts, you know, what are we doing in terms of social distancing with dance and music, whether it's band or choir and all of that. I know what we did before, I don't know what we're doing now. And then wondering also about athletics. You know, it's a, it's a world of difference between tennis and golf and football and basketball. And I'm wondering how we're addressing them because obviously we can't address them necessarily the same way. So at, at, at a future time, when you have time, I would love to have responses to those and probably other questions I'll dream up. But, but thank you so much. It's just, it's so reassuring and, and um, means everything that you all have given it, the time and the attention and the focus and the intelligence and the research that you have given it. So thank you. So I, I won't, I can visit with you on those items, but what I will tell you, Mrs. Fleurier, that one of the, the greatest things that, that I, I really am, am grateful that uh, Dr. Ross was in the board and, and so forth um, thought about, give, about the opportunity to host our summer programming this summer and bringing in students face to face because there were a lot of lessons learned. Uh, a number of the items that you, that you identified were items that we had to address this summer because we did have a lot of sports programs, arts programs, special programming um, that we had to institute processes for. And so a lot of those lessons learned this summer we're actually going to take into the fall. And I think we're that much further ahead in how, we'll, we, how, we, will, uh, how we will address all of these items that you mentioned. But absolutely, I, I, we can sit down and discuss those further, but I feel very confident that those experiences uh, have, have given us guidance on how we will address those those items as we move forward. Thank you. Dr. Runninger? A big question, ultimately, not right now necessarily, please. But the big question is, what are we going to do if and when something happens? Because you know, I heard you refer to someone would leave and one person would come back. And, and much of what I'm reading is not saying that. And so I just think we have, it's important for us to know what is the plan and what thought has been put into that plan so that we will be fully supportive of that plan. I'm sure. And, and the state That's actually right. does today. And actually, they had given us guidance actually during the summer on what protocols uh, needed to be instituted should a case arise in the summer. And so we have those protocols actually already established from summer. We're fine tuning those because obviously we're looking at, at a bigger group. But 
th those protocols actually are already established. And so uh, we, we certainly can send those out to you all through an admin Please. report. Or we can, uh, I, I'm sure that there will be another time where we're going to need to delve deeper as, as we identify further road. protocols moving into the fall. Thanks. Dr. Reininger? Yeah. Dr. Cavazos. Dr. Reininger, this is Eladio. Real quick, uh, I waited till the end so that I didn't have to ask questions. You guys pretty much asked the questions <laughs> I had. Uh, I want to, I wanna, one, uh, commend you all for, for everything that you're doing, uh, from the plan to the communication. Uh, I want to reiterate what uh, Dr. Muñiz and Perez said. Sometimes even if, if all we tell the community is we don't know yet, you know, that goes a long way with them. Uh, I want to reiterate Ms. Fleury's question also because I think it's very important about the protocol, what happens, because that's one of the questions I had. What happens once uh, someone tests positive, whether it be a teacher, a student in a, in, in a school, because I think that's one of the fears or concerns that parents and, and, and teachers have of a mini outbreak in a campus that, that they're gonna take back home uh, to, to, to the families, uh, to parents, grandparents, uh, siblings. Uh, my, my two questions that I had uh, one, um, are we encouraging, and again, we can, uh, I know we're, we're, we're pressed for time, but are we encouraging somehow uh, teachers, uh, are we going to encourage parents of students to tell us when they have gotten tested? Because someone can go get tested and continue going about their, uh, their, their normal life, you know, and sometimes... Uh, because I've, I've had the experience where friends have told me, can you believe so-and-so got uh, tested and they're still going out and doing whatever? When, you know, if they come back negative, great, but if they come back positive, that's already a couple of days uh, uh, that they may, were maybe at school teaching or attending classes. Uh, you know, they got tested on a Monday because they felt sick or they didn't feel sick or they just wanted to get tested. Once they get tested, is there any way of us finding out? Can we encourage them to let us know? Like, you know what? I went in for a test, so I'm going to have to stay stay home. And I think that that sick policy or that sick leave, if it's communicated well, it might uh, encourage them to communicate with us because maybe they they're scared that they're going to lose time and they're not going to they're not going to communicate uh, those tests with us until they get the results. You know, right. and uh, the, my other question was uh, in the pathways that the parents pick, if there's a major spike midway through a grading period, you know, the third or fourth week of a nine week period where parents had ch chosen face to face, but all of a sudden things look pretty bad, can they pull them out and just continue doing remote learning at that time? Or do they have to wait to the end of the of the grading period? Uh, those are my two questions. If, if you want to touch on them quickly, if not, we can visit later, or maybe through the admin report. Uh, but again, I just want to thank you all for everything that you're doing, uh, the information that you guys are putting out, and more than anything, the work that you guys are putting in. I'm looking forward to hear from Shane on the communication side. So, uh, so, so, Dr. Nagalad, I'll I'll jump in here. I'm going to go ahead and and offer some clarity on some of the things that the board has been asking. And so just want to kind of take us to the 30,000 foot view uh, of what we're trying to stand up in a very unique uh, time. Uh, so we are still regulated by the Texas Education Agency. And the Texas Education Agency puts out some very strict guidelines of what we can and cannot do. Uh, the flexibility comes in us doing even more versus doing less. Uh, and so to give you an example, uh, the Texas Education Agency has said that it doesn't matter if you offer hybrid or you offer remote. It cannot be in lieu of a five-day-a-week program where you open all your campuses. So let me repeat that. You will not get funded for a hybrid or a remote programming if you don't have your campuses open for face-to-face -face instruction for all the kids that the parents want to send to the schools. So you can't tell a parent you have to go hybrid. That is not an option. And so when some of you have seen other districts that have done different things and said, well, we're all going to go online, 
that is not a model that's going to be supported and they will not get their state funding. So that we need to be very clear about that, that the whole movement by the state is that the children have a right to return to their campuses, and the parents have a right to send them to their campuses. And so the building blocks for that is you must open your campuses to any student that wants to return five days a week. So our percent at 38 percent, and it may be 40 percent, it may be 20 percent, the bottom line, we have to open our schools, okay? From there, we have building blocks, and the choice is really parents. It's not the employee that has the choice. It's the parents that have the choice. And at any point that the district begins to push parents to make a decision, then you violate the regulations put forth by the agency and you risk being audited and losing your funding, okay? So you can't tell a, a kid, look, you probably would benefit better if you go remote. Uh, you, we're gonna register as a remote student. That's not an option to the school districts. So we, it, contextually, we have to remember that. So this summer, when we were one of the few districts that did summer programming, we were testing all the modes of instruction face-to-face, -face. we were doing blended learning, what we call hybrid, and we were doing totally online to test our broadband, to test the response of kids, to test how we would do things. All of that, we kind of got ahead of the game and have tested. To give you an example, we have 500 students, elementary students right now, approximately, they're enrolled in online instruction as a jumpstart program. 500. So those are all remote students. However, this is something that we have to wrap our minds around. That model is not going to be the only model that we can offer. It's not acceptable, and it's not going to be authorized by the agency. What you need to know is that all those 500 students are being taught remotely, but all teachers are reporting to the campus to deliver the instruction from the campus where they have access to all their resources, they have access to our broadband, with, they have access to their computer information. So when we talk about, well, there may be a staff member that may be scared, all that is going to run through the Human Services Department, which there are federal guidelines that require of what we can and cannot do. But you have to keep in mind that when you open schools for the little children, the adults have to return to deliver instruction, right? And so there will be some mitigating factors. For example, there may be a teacher that does great work remotely, has some underlying conditions that says, is there any way that I can have a foolproof remote instructional program that means I have no face-to-face -face kids in my classroom. I just report to my classroom, I do my remote teaching, I model what I need to do, I do all my work, but I am there because keep in mind that what the agency has made very clear, at whatever point a parent wants to bring their kids full-time to the campus, they have a right to do that. Now, here's the other thing that's out there, and so you, I'm trying to clarify a couple of points, is that this is so fluid that you may start with 38% face-to-face and parents have so much confidence in our protocols that we ramp up to 60% within three days or three weeks. And keep in mind that we started very small our summer programming, we ramped up, I mean we had 200 kids showing up to strength and conditioning once they tested our protocols, right? And so the other thing that the agency just put out, and this just is fresh off the press, is that, number one, the districts can offer a hybrid, but not in lieu of face-to-face. Face-to-face, five days a week, is a required program that you must offer. What they also put out is that they're going to allow the districts to have a three-week phase-in to test their protocols. So let me be very clear. Those three weeks, some districts are going to need them because they didn't test any protocols over the summer, right? So they need that. But what is not going to be an option 
is that every kid who does not have internet at home or does not have a technology tool, you must open your campus and they must return. So you can do a phase in where you bring groups of kids back, just as an example. We may say that uh, all the kids that have hybrid, that choose an alternating day, those kids will not report, they'll stay online for three weeks and then after three weeks, they'll start migrating into the campus for their alternating day program, whatever that looks like, as a hybrid. But all the kids who do not have internet or technology, we must open our doors for, okay? So I'm gonna give you an example. Our latest information, we have about 958 kids that do not have internet connectivity. So even if we did a phase in, you have a potential 900 kids that will have to return to our campuses, right? So I wanna, I wanna be sure that we all are understanding the fact that when we say we wanna protect our staff, and I do too, and we wanna protect our kids and so forth, uh, Ms. Luray asked, how many days will we be closed? Well, the state has dictated. If you have a situation at the campus, they just put out their guidelines. Today, they just put out their guidelines. If you have a case, you are not allowed to close for longer than five days. You get in there, you disinfect, and you must return to face-to-face -to -face instruction uh, or, you, or you are not in compliance with the state regulations. Now, they have a whole group of medical team experts that are working with them, right? But I just sent you those documents and they're public documents. I sent you those documents so that you can see what the state regulations are. I say that because this is such a moving organization and it's so organic that we're pivoting and we're being nimble to the extent that we can. But one thing that has not changed and they have not taken any compromise on that is that you will open your schools. And for parents that wanna send them five days a week, you have to instruct them and you have to provide face-to-face -face instruction. That model, is not open for compromise. So we had a couple of districts that said, we're gonna spend three weeks on just online. Uh, that is not gonna be acceptable unless 100% of their kids have internet connectivity and no parents have said they wanna come face to face, which I doubt. One of the things that I keep getting on information is parents saying, I have to go to work. I, I gotta return the kids, right? now." We are going above and beyond. There is nothing in the regulations that the agency is saying we must provide water bottles for kids. We must do touchless water fountains for kids. We must have those sprayers uh, to disinfect. There, there's nothing in the, we're going above and beyond in the protocols because we believe that we have an obligation to protect our kids and our staff in our buildings. And so there's, there's some conversations about, well, can I do, uh, remote teach and just stay home. Well, that, as long as we're teaching kids, people have to come back to work, right? And those kids are coming. Now, can we accommodate where we isolate you and we provide you a space where you don't have face-to-face? -face? It depends. Because it also, one of the things the agency has not released and has not relinquished is that all teachers must be certified for the areas they're teaching. So if I have a teacher that is certified to do dual instruction and I have 10 kids that are coming face to face, that teacher has to return. I only have that teacher, right? And so now the mitigating factor is when they may get the infection or somebody may get all those protocols, you should feel comfortable knowing that Ms. Scoggin and her group have been working those protocols already. We've had situations because of our, our summer programming. So what I want you to find is some comfort knowing that as we navigate this big ship and we stand up a very different school district, one of the things that we have to figure out from the very onset is this, is that while you may compromise how you deliver over here, the one thing that has not moved is you will be held accountable to an A through F system. And so quality instruction, and I appreciate Mr. De Leon bringing that up, just talking about the academics, that quality of instruction cannot be compromised, regardless of the modality of delivery of instruction. And that's the purpose of instructional reset, right? 
And so there's a lot of moving parts, but I appreciate that each and every one of you uh, have read your materials, have been keeping up to date, have asked the questions, uh, but I can't be more appreciative uh, than my staff. And, and I have to hand it over to my senior team for the incredible work uh, that is being done to stand up a very different school district, but I think one that we're gonna be very proud of because we will continue to deliver quality education. That is our, that is our obligation and we're gonna make certain that we account for all kids. And so uh, just find comfort in that and we're gonna to continue to work diligently to provide you that information and those guidelines. Uh, there's already a lot of buzz because the agency made it very clear that no plan will be authorized unless there's a full face-to-face -face option on the table. And some districts had moved away from a face-to-face -face option. That's not allowed. You can't do that. So. Stick with us, we're gonna navigate this. Uh, this is, this is uh, interesting times. Uh, my, my son, uh, Chris Matthew, that's gotta go back to tech, they have told him that he has to return, that there will not be a full online option. So he packed a little quicker than I wanted him to pack, so I guess he's ready to go back and tired of being quarantined. So uh, thank you, staff, and thank you, Dr. Nerella, for the heavy lifting, Joseph, Lori, everybody for the heavy lifting they're doing and we'll keep you abreast of everything that we're doing and, and, and continue to, to make you proud and make this community proud and, and, and built on the trust that we've created over time. Thank you, Dr. Cavazos. There is um, no doubt uh, the, the amount of work that is happening and will continue to happen and uh, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna use this as a transition to um, Mr. Strubhart, who gets to figure out unique ways to communicate all of the complexities <laughs> that you have uh, just painted in, uh, for us. So, Mr. Strubhart, would you like to give us a communication plan for reopening update? Thank you, Chairman Reiniger, trustees, uh, administration, Dr. Cavazos. Uh, yeah, that's a, that's a tough presentation to follow. Thank you, Dr. Cavazos, for that close. <laughs> I, I forgot everything I was going to say after hearing all of that. That was, that was great information. Um, as you just experienced, there's a lot of information in regards to this uh, pathway to reopening and the situation we're currently in. Uh, it is a fluid situation, and uh, which makes it challenging. This summer has been challenging in communicating because much of the information, as Dr. Cavazos alluded to, is um, we're waiting on from the state, from the state level. And so a lot of the questions that parents might have um, of us, we still have to get guidance from the state before we can communicate a plan. Uh, but Dr. Uh, Noyola has put together an amazing pathway to, uh, to reopening plan. And so I'm gonna share today uh, our plan, our communication plan to communicate this amazing plan. So let me just get this going here. I want, to, I want to first talk about, can y'all hear me okay? Mm -hmm. Using the microphone, not the off my computer. Yes. Okay, yes. great. Uh, I want to talk about the channels of communication. Uh, when I speak of channels, you might refer to them as, as mediums of communication, modes of communication, methods of communication. Uh, we call them channels. So think of a, the old TV uh, that you used where you used to click, 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 you know, turn the dial, and you, know, you went to a different channel. Uh, that's how this, this kind of works here. Uh, each one of these channels is a, is a medium that we use to communicate to uh, all of our ACISD family. And keep in mind, there's not one form of communication that works for everybody. You know, uh, you know I know that some of us read the paper, um, but may not be on Facebook. Some people you know, may get all their information from Facebook, but not read the paper. So it's important for us to exist in all these mediums so that we can do our best to try to communicate with everybody in our community. So I'm gonna go over uh, these, these channels of communication uh, with you so you know which, which mediums we're using. Uh, online streaming services. Everyone knows YouTube. Everyone's you know, watched a YouTube video. That is a streaming service uh, that's a very popular. Uh, but in addition to YouTube, there's also uh, music uh, streaming services like Pandora and Spotify. Uh, you know, think of a, you know, for those of you who don't know Pandora and Spotify, it's like a radio station, but it's an online radio station. Uh, they're very popular, especially uh, amongst young people. 
Uh, in those mediums, uh, we have advertised in the past, and we will continue to advertise in those mediums um, this new pathway, the pathway options. And so I wanted to share that these online streaming services, we work through a company called AIM Media, who helps us uh, communicate through these mediums. And so those, that's one of the, the channels we're going to use are the online streaming services. Uh, social media, that is one of our biggest uh, mediums for communication. Facebook being the largest uh, way that we communicate with our community. Mm -hmm. Uh, most of our parents are on Facebook. We did a survey last summer uh, of all, not all of our parents, but uh, many of our parents, and it was a face-to-face -face survey too, asking parents, what, how do you communicate with the district? And Facebook was the number one uh, choice that they chose. But we're also in other social media platforms like Instagram, which is a growing social media platform for young people, uh, Snapchat and Twitter as well. Snapchat, so that's what all the, high, all the high school kids are using. So we're using those social media platforms as well to communicate. And I'll show you an example of that in just a minute. Uh, radio, I think some of you may know um, Jay Cantu. He's a local DJ. He's also a parent from Long Elementary. And he is also a DJ uh, at, with iHeart uh, Radio. And so that is like channel, that's uh, 104, 107, KTEX. The, all the big radio stations. Well, we plan to uh, utilize, we've already reached out to them. Uh, we'll be advertising uh, through the radio and also doing interviews. They have opportunities for us to sit down and interview uh, with them uh, live on the radio so we can communicate a lot of these uh, questions that parents might have about our uh, pathway to reopening. Uh, television, uh, Brianna, it comes from the television world. Uh, she's on the, the Zoom as well. Uh, she has a great relationship with all the channels, Channel 4, also Channel 23, now it's all combined, uh, Channel 5 and Fox. So we can reach out to them, uh, and they will show up to our events. But they also have morning shows where we can uh, talk in depth about what we're doing with, with uh, ACISD. They're ready for us, uh, and so we'll be scheduling those interviews. They're real early, so we're going to send Dr. Noyola at 5 in the morning to be at those interviews. <laughs> no, I see, I see her shaking her finger. No, come on, Dr. Noyola. Help us out here. Um, uh, also, I'm our... <laughs> Can someone mute her, please? <laughs> um, so, RG Vision Magazine. We, we chose RG Vision Magazine because it has the best distribution model in the Valley. You, whether you go to the uh, South Padre Island, Brownsville, to Edinburgh, Mission, you're going to probably see a copy of RG Vision magazine in the office, in the office somewhere or in a convenience store. Uh, they do have it because of that distribution model and because of the quality of the magazine. We can uh, continue our partnership with them, where we uh, do offer a story in every publication. It's a bi-monthly publication and an ad as well. So that we're going to continue to do that. That's one effective way of getting our, uh, the word out throughout the entire valley. Uh, Blackboard messaging. Blackboard uh, owns, uh, they bought out several companies. They bought out our messaging and texting system. They also bought out our web, the web services that we, were, that we uh, have. So we use Blackboard to put on for our website, uh, for emails, phones, text. If you're a parent in ACISD, You've gotten a text or a phone call or an email by using, you know, by us using the Blackboard messaging system. Uh, it's a very, very convenient, uh, very effective way. We use that to get the that great number of responses uh, for our survey. And so, uh, something new we're going to add is Google Word Search. If I think just about all of us have used Google or or continue to use Google, when you go to Google and you start typing in a search and you hit enter. Uh, you're probably going to see some ads at the top of that screen. Well, if you are a potential candidate for ACISD or if you have kids, uh, you're probably going to see an ad from ACISD if you're in this area. And so that's something that uh, Brianna is also working on with AIM Media to make sure that we are be in those Google word searches. Geofencing, it's a very neat um, way to effectively reach targeted audiences. Geofencing allows us to select a geographic area. For example, I could choose the uh, Peter Piper Pizza. I want everyone in Peter Piper Pizza that's on Facebook that, that meets this criteria. I want uh, females from the age of 25 to 40. Uh, maybe they have kids. I want them to see our ad. 
And so that's geofencing. We can actually target in a geographic area. So we're going to be using some targeted geofencing um, ads to reach our, our families in certain areas. Also, we're going to start a video series with Dr. Cavazos and the senior team where we will do a Q&A in, uh, online. Uh, we're going to do it via the studio and via Zoom where we cover uh, if, you know, frequently asked questions of our parents. There's so much information that needs to get out. It can't be done in just one form. It has to be cons uh, done consistently uh, and different messages need to be sent out. We have a great partnership with Valley Morning Star. Several years ago, they reached out to us. They saw they were producing a lot of stories online, and they wanted us to give them two stories a week, and they gave us the Monday edition uh, or one page in, the, in, the Monday, in their Monday edition. So every Monday, we provide two stories to the Valley Morning Star. And Dr. Cavazos called me in a few weeks ago. Uh, this was about mid-June. He said, we need to be very targeted in our Monday stories. I want a story for that focuses on health and safety, and I want a, a story that focuses on academics in the Monday paper. And boy, that, that, that was right on the mark. And we've been doing that, and those stories have been gaining a lot of traction. And I'll share a little bit, a piece of that with you in just a moment. So we continue to use the newspaper as a great way to communicate as well. Um, our airport app, you've uh, flown Southwest Airlines. We have probably the best real estate for advertising at the, uh, the airport. When you walk down the hallway after you get off of uh, uh, um, Southwest Airlines, you'll see our big, beautiful, lit sign over there. So we continue to use that. Uh, we have you know, a great story to tell. We've got some beautiful ads that we put up there. Uh, we're going to be updating that in, in August uh, with uh, the reopening of our schools. Uh, we're going to be doing some direct mail ads as well, uh, explaining the pathway to reopening and our, and our options for parents. And so parents are, will be getting a direct mail uh, ad uh, in, at the end of this month, early August. And then our most important uh, uh, channel of communication, and that's our ambassadors. Beginning with our board, tonight you got a lot of information about our pathway to reopening. You are now armed with information that you can share with the community. Uh, we continue to do that with uh, other folks as well. Dr. Cavazos, for example, he has several meetings scheduled with um, our PTA presidents, for example, where he's going to have a, com a conversation with them to talk about our pathway to reopening and, and to field questions there. Uh, he has a meeting scheduled with all of our teachers of the year to inform them what's going on, but also to get feedback uh, from them. And so it's important that we inform the people that we're directly in, in contact with first, So, because they're our ambassadors. They're the ones that go out in the community and say, hey, this is what ACISD is doing. And that's always been a great uh, thing about ACISD is that we have so many champions in our district that continue to share our message. So those are our channels of communication. I'm going to jump into uh, an example of how we tell our story. Going back to what Dr. Cavasso said about uh, putting out those two stories a week in the Valley Morning Star, uh, we had, here's an example here from uh, Paige talking about Canvas. Uh, we had three weeks of great stories about academics where we adopted Seesaw for elementary, Google um, Classroom for middle school, and we adopted Canvas for high school. That's big, those are big pieces of information that parents need to know. And so to y'all's point about, you know, we need to be constantly getting the word out, we have been. We've been, we've been uh, writing stories about all the things that ACISD is doing um, on those two fronts. And also, the, the, we've been writing on the health side. We've been writing about the sprayers, about the, um, the, the, the washing stations and the, the refillable bottles. Uh, those have been very popular stories as well. And so we continue to do that. We're writing some new stories this week. So that has been a great tool for us as the Valley Morning Star. But I also want to share uh, our relationship with Travis Whitehead. I think all of you know who Travis Whitehead is. He's, I'm sure he's called you once or you've spoken to him and been interviewed by him. Uh, he's a, a great writer. And uh, you can see Dr. Noel on the front page of, of Sunday's paper over here <laughs> where she's talking about um, the pathway to, to reopening. Uh, we, you know, we worked with him. And he got us uh, on the front page of uh, the Valley Morning Star because that story was so important. And so we have a great relationship with him and the Valley Morning Star, and they continue to tell, tell us our, tell our story. I also want to share some of our uh, social media posts. These two stories on the right 
were one of our two of our most popular stories on Facebook, and they were the uh, the the touchless uh, refilling stations for um, your water bottles and the washing hand washing station. We had over twenty thousand people reached on the hand washing stations, and over eighteen thousand people reached on the refillable bottles. That's a lot of people, <laughs> and we had one hundred and seventeen shares on on the one and one hundred eighteen shares on the other. These are these are little pieces of information that we're putting about uh, there are so many things that we're doing on the health and safety and the academic side that we're we're giving them little morsels of information uh throughout these weeks because there's just so much to digest right and so the, these were great posts and then of course we've all we're put everything that we're doing on the valley morning star side we're sharing that on social media and our website as well we're not just putting it out in one platform we're putting out multiple platforms so that uh, we're consistent with that message, and of course, we, you know, there's an, uh, an academic store. Six thousand people reached on the the story about uh, the seesaw program. Important information, but I wanted to share this on social media. How some of these uh, stories that we're sharing are blowing up because very few districts are putting this information out. ACISD is the only one that's. There's a lot of work going on, and we have a lot to tell, and so people are super excited to see all the things that we're doing, and we still have a lot more, to, obviously, to tell, right? So I wanted to share that piece with you. And then real briefly, I want to cover the, the timeline. This is scaffolding. So uh, as, as we go through the weeks, these will build on top of each other. So we've already started the survey. That was last week. We sent out the survey. We've gotten the survey results um, with the Valley Morning Star. Um, and you know, in that survey, at the same time we sent out the survey, I want to share this with you. Uh, we reached out to the PTA president for the city council which is Elias Ortega, and B. Cruz, the vice president. We reached out to them last week, and he said, hey, we're forming, we're putting together frequently asked questions. Can you please reach out to all of your PTA presidents and in turn have them reach out to all of their parents to ask them what are the, most, what are your, what are the questions that you want, you want to ask of ACISD? They gave that to us uh, early yesterday, and that is what drove the FAQs that you saw. So Dr. Noyola and I sat down together and we went through every single question that was asked of the PTAs um, and what we saw on social media. And that's what, that's what formulated our FAQ. So the FAQs have actually been in the works for, for, so for some time. We just wanted to make sure that we were, were reaching out to the right people to get those questions uh, asked. Uh, so th this is week two. We're launching our social media campaigns. Uh, we got our studio of interviews ready to go. Uh, Google search is going to be uh, going. We're continuing with our, all of our Blackboard messaging. Uh, we're going to start our radio streaming, radio and streaming services and direct mail mailers uh, next week. Uh, by the end of this month, we'll have our airport ad and television interviews done. And then uh, in August, we'll be uh, doing our RG Vision. We'll come out with our next article. And then we're going to continue all of these um, campaigns uh, throughout the, uh, the the month and into August before school starts. And so there's a lot of information, a lot of different moving pieces, um, but we are, uh, and, and the timeline is flexible. As you know, as you, Dr. Dr. Vasso has alluded to, this is constantly evolving, right? And so we'll, as, but we're, we're adjusting as, uh, as the wind blows, we adjust our sails and we continue to move forward. So. I, I, I know that was fast, but <laughs> we're still a little short on time. So if anybody has any questions, I'm open for questions. Thank you, Mr. Stewart-Hart. Uh, trustees, do we have any questions? That was an awesome presentation. Thank you. Great good job, Shane. Good, good stuff, Shane. Appreciate good job, Shane. it. Do you ever sleep is the question. <laughs> Wait, you all, you all had a lot of questions for Dr. Nerola. Come on, people. <laughs> <clears throat> yeah, I, I think um, for me, Shane, the, the comprehensiveness of what you presented is, um, you know, so important and in, in, in fact critical to getting the word out to um, our, our, you know, our HCISD family and, you know, the, the, the other reality of it, why you have this timeline, nothing turns off on that timeline, right? So, you know, you, you start in week one and things are happening and you gotta keep that going and then you throw in the week two activities and week three, et, et cetera. And so it becomes um, layered and, and complex. And then the fact that you will have more information, new information as things continue to change through all of those channels. So 
um, I commend you and, and Brianna and your, you know, your whole team uh, and the way you all work together. Madam Chair, I, have a, I do have a question for, for Shane. Just a, Shane, um, great presentation. I agree Thanks. with the chairman um, mm -hmm. uh, and the rest of the board and the superintendent. I mean, you're doing an amazing job, and, and I, I agree. I don't know when you guys sleep. Um, <laughs> I, I, you know, there's so many questions, and, and, and I think Bobby said it, or, 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 or Nolan said it, where communication is a key, and it is, and, and, and I think we're hitting all levels of everything. Um, is there is there any way that and maybe you're already doing it, Shane? You probably are. Is there any way that there's a maybe a Google Doc so that teachers and faculty and anybody else that has any questions they can be asking questions live and somebody answering it? Um, is there is there any way that there can be that kind of dialogue where let's say mm -hmm. tomorrow there's a there's a question that uh, uh, maybe a teacher has or a paraprofessional or someone has and. And they can they can Google Google it to, to and it's just for the HCISD. It's not mm -hmm. for the community, so that they could we can have that dialogue going back and forth, so that it's immediate questions, immediate answers. Almost like a like a tech support, right? Calling tech support and kind getting of something like that. Yeah. Um, um, of course, we're always our doors are always open, but I like the chat the chat uh, idea that you have. Almost like when you go online and you want to buy something and the little chat window comes up. Would you like to chat with somebody? Is that what you're talking about? Something along yeah. that lines? Yeah, that's a neat idea. I kind of like that idea. I know that we did create a an email address uh, called pathway to reopening at acisd.org. And um, Alicia has been responding to a ton of emails that she's been getting. Um, so we do have the email available to us. But that's something that um, I'm going to write that down, something that we could possibly explore. Yeah. And you know, and then the reason I say that is because there's a lot of a lot of staff that have some questions and concerns, but maybe they're shy, mm -hmm. or maybe they don't feel comfortable asking their assistant principal or the principal or whoever it may be. And it and they're it's they're able to open up and and do it at their in you know their computer where no one you know no one knows, or maybe they do have to know if they put their name there. So I mean, maybe something that they do have to say it, and they have to identify who they are. But it's still a little, e it's a little easier if it's in a computer mm -hmm. rather than calling. Just, just food Thanks. For thought. Thanks for that. Appreciate that. Very good. So, Dr. Cavazos, I'm going to turn it over to you uh, to discuss our fourth agenda item topics for future meetings. So, as you know, that while all this is happening behind the scenes, trying to stand up a, a very different uh, school district for the fall semester. Uh, the, the topics that are going to be forthcoming are going to be centered around this very, this very general uh, movement and journey that we're on. However, uh, we're still doing some incredible things, and I want to commend Dr. Noyola and Melissa Parker for submitting the IB application for Vernon Middle School. Uh, and so that's in the works. It's been submitted. Uh, of course, they have to go through candidacy phase. Uh, they're finalizing their plans for them to come in certify Sam Houston and Austin. And so there's several programs that are in motion that we need to give you updates on. Uh, but this is going to take front and center because until we open for the fall, uh, this is going to be the hot topic uh, for now. So. Well, that is truly uh, exciting to hear. Um, and, and, and thank you to the whole team, Dr. Noyola and Melissa Parker, for getting that application in. We're all excited to hear that. All right, folks. Um, what a what a tremendous um, meeting! I, I think every one of our meetings lately just keep, uh, you know, there's so much detail and so much work that you all are doing. I know each and every one of, of, of the board just commends um, Dr. Cavazos, the whole leadership team, and just the, the staff and, and teamwork, the, the whole district. You're lifting everybody up, and we're excited for this new school year, and it is going to be a, a historic year. So. Everybody stay safe. Thanks for, for joining today.